My daughter didn't want to let me come up here. It's okay. It's okay, Everly. Poppy's got to go to work so we can go to Disneyland. <laughs> like, there's, for those of you who are parents, like, there's so much truth to that, right? Like, <laughs> we got to go to work. Autumn, where are you? God cannot give you more than you can handle. So uh, at some point, Autumn will be preaching up here. I just, God gave me, God gave me that word, and I don't know when, how, or what, um, but uh, I know that she's staying in Chicago for college, so um, we, we have at least four years to work with her. Um, amen, yeah. Um, will you bow your heads with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we speak the name of Jesus over this time that we have together now. We speak Jesus over our hearts, our minds, our souls. Father, we speak Jesus over the word that we're going to hear, the word that you have prepared from the beginning of time. And so, God, it is my prayer that you would move the preacher out of the way. And that while it might be my voice, that it would be your words. And Father, that you would speak to the depths of our souls the very thing that we need. And God, we ask, I ask, that you would challenge us today. God, we don't want to leave the same way that we came in. God, challenge us. God, change us. God, we give you permission. Transform us. And for those who are here who are reluctant, for those who are here because they came, because their wife or their husband or their parents wanted, God, for them, we ask that you would give them a double portion of your spirit now. We pray Jesus in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So today we, I'm excited um, because we're starting our brand new sermon series called Jump In. And I got to tell you that we went over so many different iterations of what we were going to call this sermon series. So I'm just going to go off from the, from, the, from the beginning. What we realized is that God was bringing us to a book that was written about 10 years ago, 12 years ago called Not a Fan. Have any of you read that book, Not a Fan by Kyle Eidelman? And in it, the author basically says, look, most Christians are fans of Jesus. Most Christians are fans of Jesus. They, they're really good at doing religion. They're really good at coming to church. Some of you even came to church your entire life. You memorized the Bible verses. You dressed the right way. You said the right things. You gave your tithe. You gave your offering. You even volunteered. And he says, we're really good at plain religion. But very few of us are willing to be deeply devoted followers of Jesus. Because it's easy to believe in Jesus. Even the devil believes in Jesus. I don't think he's saved. But even the devil believes. It's easy for us to believe. It's easy for us to hear these stories of Jesus. But it's harder to be a follower of Jesus. And so what we knew is that we wanted to have six weeks together where we're going to be asking the hard questions about whether you are a truly devoted follower of Jesus or if you just like to play religion. So the, the series title is called Jump In, and we went through different iterations. At first, it was more than a fan, but that was like, oh, we're ripping off the cover of that book too much. And then it was all in. And then I woke up one morning and I sent a text to the team and I said, I think it has to be Jump In. Because here's what happens. When you jump in, there is no going back. I remember being a kid, and we were on the roof of our house, me and my two friends. Um, Anthony's not in here, but we did really dumb stuff too, Anthony. I won't quote 50 Cent, but, you know, I don't know any of those lyrics. Except for, no, I'm anyway. anyway, so then, so we're sitting on the roof of our house, of my house. And we're like, hey, it's not that far. Why don't we jump? Yo, let's jump. So my two friends are like, okay, they're just as dumb as I was. So they jumped, well, I almost fell. They jumped first and they were fine. And I thought to myself, well, if they did it, I can do it. Except that the more I thought about it, the less I wanted to jump. Have you ever been in that circumstance? The more you think about something, the easier it is for you to talk yourself out of it. And I remember sitting there for minutes and my friends were telling me, come on, come on, jump. And then I realized I gotta just not think about it. I just have to take that jump. And I got to tell you, when you're in the air for that half a second, that fraction of a second, you can't take it back. 
You can't hold on to anything. You are committed 100%, whether you're gonna come out with a broken leg or you're gonna be all good, but you are committed. And that's the decision that I want you, every single one of you to make today, that you are gonna be deeply devoted followers of Jesus. And I know what you're saying. Pastor, I've already been baptized. I've already been born again. Pastor, I've been going to church my whole life. I've even gotten up there and prayed and preached. I have done all that. But what we're gonna find out today is that you may think that you've been a follower, but really you've just been a fan. You've just been an admirer of Jesus, but you haven't committed your whole life to him. So I wanna invite you to open your Bibles with me if you have them to John chapter three. John chapter three, verse one. And here's what the Bible tells us. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. So Nicodemus, and if you've been in church long enough, you probably know this story. John 3 is one of those books in scripture that are quoted all over the world. John 3, 16, right? We have seen WWE events where people are holding up signs that say John 3, 16. Is that right? That's weird, right? We have been to events where there is people who are standing outside of stadiums with the words John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, what? That whoever, yeah, we know this. We know this. But we come to John chapter three and we see this story of Nicodemus. And I hope that we can see it in a new way with new eyes today. Now, the Bible tells us that Nicodemus was a leader among the Jews. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, which meant that Nicodemus was better at doing religion than you are on your very best day. Nicodemus, by the time he was 12 years old, would have memorized the Old Testament. How much of the Old Testament? All of it. Like we patted ourselves for memorizing one Bible verse every 13 weeks or, or one Bible verse a week for 13 weeks. And then we would get up in church growing up and we would say our Bible verses and we would get little stars on our crowns that signified our crowns in heaven. But this guy had memorized everything. He was really good at looking religious. He was a part of the Sanhedrin. He was a part of the most elite of the elite religious people. Nicodemus was a leader. People saw Nicodemus and said, I want to be religious like that guy. If he was alive today, he would be the guy that was up here preaching. He would be the guy that was up here praying. He would be the guy that our community would look to and say, we want to be just like him. And then the Bible tells us that Nicodemus, who was someone of influence, comes to Jesus by what? By night. Because in the darkness, he could conceal his identity. You see, Nicodemus had memorized the whole Bible. Nicodemus knew what it was to look for the Messiah. And when he sees Jesus, he heard his teachings. He, he saw that people were healed, that the blind were given sight. He saw 5,000 people be fed with just a few loaves and a few fish, that this Jesus could do impossible things. And he sees him, and I can only imagine him thinking, might Jesus be the one that we've been waiting for? Might Jesus be the one about those Bible verses that I memorized in Isaiah? Might this Jesus be the one? But here's the thing. He couldn't go to Jesus in the day. He could never be caught talking to Jesus because the Pharisees, especially the religious leaders, they would want nothing to do with Jesus. The Bible would tell us that they would look for ways to end Jesus's life. So he would never go to Jesus in the daytime because he would be ostracized from his inner group, from his clique. So the Bible tells us that Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night because he wants to know more about this Jesus. And verse three says, after Nicodemus says, you, you can only do these things because of Jesus, because of the presence of God, Nicodemus says, uh, Jesus says, sorry, my language. Jesus answered him, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. 
No one can see the kingdom of God unless they have been born again. You see, Jesus goes right to it. He knows that Nicodemus is there for something deeper. He knows that Nicodemus is there because he longs to see the fulfillment of everything that he's ever learned. And so Jesus challenges Nicodemus and he says, look, I don't want you to just play religion. I don't want you to just go through the motions. I want your heart to be changed and transformed. So when Jesus tells him, you have to be born again, what he's really saying is, you have to surrender every part of your life. See, Nicodemus wasn't ready to surrender. He came to Jesus at night because he wasn't ready for the cost of being ostracized and kicked out of his group. Because if his other Pharisees would have seen him, they would have kicked him out. It's like modern day um, politics. Here's what happens in politics today. If you're a Republican, anything a Democrat says, even if there's some truth to it, you have to automatically be against it. And vice versa, right? Amen? I mean, not really amen, but you know what I mean. But in our current culture, we are so polarized, we are so divided, that wherever you find yourself on the spectrum of political ideology, no matter what the other side says, you're always going to be against it. That's, that's sadly the way it is. Well, in the first century, if you were a Pharisee, that's the same way you would treat whatever Jesus said. Anything Jesus says, you were automatically against it, even if he was giving sight to the blind, even if he was healing the crippled. Even if he was inviting people to this eternal life, they were against it. And they would even say things like, Jesus has a demon. They were so against what Jesus was doing that they were demonizing Jesus for what he was doing. And these were the religious people. These were the people that memorized the entire Old Testament. These were the people that held to truth. And what this teaches us is that it is possible for you to know the Bible front and back. It is possible that you are coming to church every single weekend. It is possible that you are reading your Bible every day and going to Sabbath school and going to all of our serve opportunities. It is possible that you are looking really good externally as a Christian, but your heart can be far from God. And for Nicodemus, he wasn't ready to take that jump. He wasn't ready to jump in because it was going to cost him his reputation. It was going to cost him a living. It was going to cost him everything. And he wasn't ready. To be born again means that you are willing to submit and surrender every part of your life. Not just your religious life, but your marriage, your friendships, your work, your habits, your hobbies, the things that you watch on your phone. To be born again means that you are willing to give everything to God. Because what happens is when we surrender, what you're doing is that you are making a decision that you want Jesus to be Lord of your life. And when Jesus is Lord of your life, you are no longer the one that is sitting behind the, the, the driver's seat. You are now the passenger, and Jesus is the one who is going to drive you going forward. But let's be honest. It is hard to let Jesus be the pilot of our ship. Because, I, listen, I just over the last few weeks, I have a five-year plan. I have a 10-year plan. I have a 20-year plan. I have goals that I wrote down that I carry in my notebook. And I tell myself, if I can do these things, I will look back on my life and say, man, I, I really did what I wanted to. Like, I, this was successful. I achieved what I wanted. The scary part is saying, Jesus, here's what I want. Here's what I would love to see. But whatever your will is, let that be. Do you know that's a hard prayer to pray? Because God's will for your life may look different than your desire for your own life. And that is a scary proposition. So what happens is we come to church, we do the praise, we do the sermons, we read our Bibles, but we're not really submitting everything to Jesus. But Jesus says, if you would just be born again, if you would just submit all of yourself, I will do the work of transformation. So to be a deeply devoted follower of Jesus means that you simply have to make a decision that you want to submit your life to Christ. That is the first 
step in living a life of deep devotion to Jesus. For these six weeks, what we want to do is to help you to get to a place that when we are done, by the time that we are done, that you want to live a fully devoted life to Jesus. That even if it costs you everything, knowing that you are following Jesus will be worth the sacrifice. And so Jesus tells him, you must be born again. You must surrender that one time, that first decision. But guys, let me be honest. Every single day you have to be surrendering to Jesus. Every single day must be a daily surrender to Jesus. Before you get out of bed, surrender your life to Jesus because when Jesus is the one who is leading you, when Jesus is the one who is guiding you, he may take you down a path you weren't expecting, but it will always be better than you can imagine. The reason that we dedicate our lives to this Jesus is because when you surrender, it is only then that you can experience the fullness of joy and love and peace. Because we all want inner peace. We all want joy. And the thing about being born again is that sometimes we come to Jesus because we want him to fix our marriage. We want him to fix our finances. We want him to um, fix our job situations. We want him to help us do whatever it is that we want. Sometimes we come to Jesus because we think, well, there's no other option. If I go to Jesus, then he's gonna help me. But see, the thing is that what Jesus really cares more about is not so much your circumstances. He cares about your circumstances. But he cares more about your heart. He cares more about what's going on inside the depths of your heart and your soul. And when we surrender to Jesus, we give Jesus the permission to change us from the inside out. That's what matters first. That is the first decision that you have to do is I want to be full tilt, all in, two feet in, jumping in, surrendering our lives to Jesus. And so in John chapter three, verse four, Nicodemus says to Jesus, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. That's baptism. What is born of the flesh is flesh, but what is born of the spirit is spirit. And do not be astonished that I said this to you, that you must be born from above. Verse eight, the wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Jesus is telling him, look, all you have to do is make a decision to surrender yourself to Jesus. All you do is surrender, the Holy Spirit will do the rest. But you see, we live in a world where we like to pull up ourselves by our own bootstraps and we try to live perfectly. So we go to the Ten Commandments, we go to the Old Testament, we try to have these long lists of what we think we have to do in order to be in God's good graces. But what Jesus says is, look, the only thing you can do is surrender and the Holy Spirit will do the rest. He says, you don't, you don't know where the wind comes from, you don't know where it goes. He's like, you don't have to, that's for me to know. Just know that it's gonna do its work. So, you know, I love, um, and by the way, if you want to get the most out of these six weeks that we're going to be delving into what it looks like to be a true follower of Jesus, I mean, I want to invite you to buy the book, Not a Fan by Kyle Eidelman. Um, it, we're not going through all of it, but you can read that. It's super easy, super simple. It's super easy to read, but it'll give you some more context for what we're talking about. The other thing that you can do is read Desire of Ages. Like I, I was reading that as I was looking at the Nicodemus story, and I, I, I could tell you, like, I underlined so many different passages in Desire of Ages, and most of you who were raised in the church have a copy somewhere. Maybe it's in the back of your bookshelf, but you have it, and, and that book will help you to give more context. But I want to read a passage from that book. Desire of Ages, page 173, here's how the Holy Spirit is described says, by an agency as unseen as the wind, Christ is working upon the heart. Little by little, perhaps unconsciously to the receiver, impressions are made that tend to draw the soul to Christ. These may be received through meditating upon him, 
through reading the scriptures or through hearing the word from the living preacher. But suddenly as the spirit comes with more direct appeal, the soul gladly surrenders itself to Jesus. By many, this is called sudden conversion, but it is the result of the long wooing by the spirit of God. A long wooing. God has been pursuing you. You know, and it's funny because we think that when we make that decision to surrender that it's all us because that's what we're thought to think about. But the truth is that when you surrender, it's because you've been encountered by the Spirit and you can't keep resisting. It's like falling in love with someone. You don't choose to fall in love. You can't help but fall in love because they are so irresistible. And that's what happens with the Holy Spirit. When you become aware of the Spirit, you can't help but surrender your life to Jesus. And so Jesus says to Nicodemus, all you gotta do is make that decision, that surrender, and you will be born again, and God will do everything for you. And here's the crazy part about all this. Nicodemus didn't know this. He was a religious rock star. He knew everything there was to know about the Bible and he could not understand this teaching because Nicodemus was simply a fan of who Jesus was, but he was not a follower of Jesus. You know, I'm a, I'm a fan of the Denver Broncos. Any other Broncos fans in here? Bears fans? Uh. It was 1987, I was watching my very first Monday night football game, and I remember seeing John Elway in the fourth quarter. He was a quarterback for the Denver Broncos. The Broncos were down, and John Elway led a winning play to win the game. The true comeback kid, John Elway, won the game. And from that moment, I said, that is my team. So starting that day, I started drawing pictures of John Elway. I would draw pictures at school when I was bored, when I should be listening to my math teacher. I drew pictures of running backs and quarterbacks and plays. I loved to draw. Over time, when I got money, I was able to buy T-shirts and hats and jerseys. And I was a big fan of the Denver Broncos, and I still am. In case they ever come into town and you have any box tickets at the Bears game, let me know. I'm willing to drive to Kansas City with you. Uh, and wherever else they play. <laughs> but I was a huge fan. And when they finally won the Super Bowl in the late 90s, I was like, this is perfect. I can gloat. I can tell all of my friends, my team is better than your team. And then John Elway retires, and they got really bad. So bad that every year they had a new quarterback, so bad that I didn't really want to wear my T-shirt because it was a little bit embarrassing how bad they were. And in those years before Peyton Manning came to save us again, some 15 years later, I started looking at other teams because I don't like to cheer for a losing team. Am I alone? Like I like to pick winners. So I would look at the 49ers. I would look at the Seahawks. I would look at the Chicago Bears when Jay Cutler came here. I know, love, hate him, whatever. But I was looking for other teams that had a chance to win because that's what fans do. Like you always have your team, but like you like other teams too. I don't care who you are. You like other teams. And Nicodemus was simply just a fan of Jesus from a distance when it didn't cost him anything. So when this story ends in John chapter three, we would be left to believe that Nicodemus walks away and never gives his life to Jesus. But then a few chapters later, because it costs too much, it was going to cost him his position in society. It was going to cost him his position in the group with the Sanhedrin and his other Pharisee friends. But then a few chapters later, we see that the Pharisees have this secret meeting and they're trying to come up ways that they could kill Jesus. The religious people of the day, the people who had the truth, were trying to kill the Messiah. And Nicodemus stands up and says, whoa, 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 guys, Calm, let's just cool it down. Pump the brakes a little bit. Let's just wait and see what happens. And at that point, Nicodemus had made that choice to live all in for Jesus. It would cost him his position. It would cost him his place and his influence and how people viewed him. But he knew that following Jesus, what he got from following Jesus would far outweigh everything this world could offer. And then the next time we see Nicodemus after that, he is coming to wrap Jesus' dead body after he died on the cross. And that was in the day. That was for everybody to see. 
Thousands of years later, we read the story that it was Nicodemus who first walks away from Jesus because it seemed too hard to give his life up. The same Nicodemus that comes to Jesus at night, now in full daylight so everybody can see him, now he has made that decision. That is your decision that you must make today. Are you willing to surrender every part of your life to Jesus? Or have you been holding back some parts? Have you been holding back some parts of your life that you don't want Jesus to shed light on and so you hold it back but the whole while you're only just playing at religion but you have not been following Jesus? I want to look at Psalms chapter 34. This is the invitation for you. David writes Psalm, it's not on the screen so I need you guys to listen up. Psalm 34 verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That is the decision that is before you. And I know some of you are like, I've been baptized, Pastor. I believe in Jesus. And if that's you, and if you truly are a follower of Jesus, I, I am grateful and I am glad. But I think that even for someone like me who's a pastor, I've devoted my life to serving God, to serving Jesus in the local church. I read my Bible every day. There are still moments in my day. There are times in my life where I haven't fully surrendered my life to Jesus. So you might be born again. There might have been a moment of conversion, but it's every day that you have to surrender your life to Jesus. And I want you to taste and see that the Lord truly is good. Psalm says, happy are those who take refuge in him. He says, look to Jesus and be radiant. But some of us have been chasing after other things to satisfy us. And Jesus simply wants you to make that decision today. And if that's you, you memorize scriptures, you've preached, you've prayed, you've taught Sabbath school, you've served on ministries. Maybe you have a degree in theology. Maybe you lead a Bible study. Maybe you pray with people, but you think to yourself, but I know that I haven't fully surrendered. We want that to be you. And if you feel like you've been going to church your whole life, but you want more, in our lobby on the orange wall, there are cards that say connect on them. Grab one, fill them out. Let us know, hey, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna live more deeply. I wanna give myself more to Jesus because I know that I've been holding back. Fill one of those out so that we as a church can walk alongside you. You know, next Saturday, we're starting a six-week series of small groups. Well, we're gonna be going over what I'm preaching here on Saturday mornings. And if you truly want to take that next step, join a small group. You can, um, and during what's next, we'll have a slide up that you can get that information in. But you have to do it today. You can't wait for tomorrow because tomorrow the groups are closed. And I know that doesn't sound very Christian, but like there's logistics that we have to consider. And next Saturday, when we do Connection Sabbath, we're gonna, that's going to be the first session of small groups. So if you come, you're going to be put in a group, <laughs> I guess. But we want you to make that decision. I don't want you to go another day without fully surrendering your life to Jesus. Because it's only when you follow Christ with all of your heart that you will experience the peace and the joy and the serenity that comes with following Jesus. So we want you to make that decision. And next week for Connection Sabbath, we're going to be looking at another passage, but at 10.30 a.m., it's online only, and I'm going to be doing the second part of this message of, now you've made the decision, what does it actually look like to be a follower? So I've made that mental shift, I've made that heart decision that I want to surrender, but now what does it look like as Jesus transforms us? So 10.30 a.m., I want you to jump on because we're going to go even deeper. So I can't promise that these next six weeks all have funny stories to tell, I can't promise that I'll have lots of stories, but what I can promise you is this. We're gonna go deeper than we've ever gone. We're gonna ask harder questions than we've ever asked because I believe that the most important thing you can do is give your life to Jesus.
And if at the end of these six weeks, you can say you've done that or you've recommitted your life to Jesus, then I, I will know that I have succeeded. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, you always ask us the hard questions. Most of us are here because we obviously have some type of connection to you, Jesus. But my prayer is that you, we would have, that you would have all of us. Give us the courage and the strength to surrender every part of our lives, even when it's something different than we think we want. That we might experience the true fullness of your presence and your joy and your peace. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.